Okay. Well, uh, I have some thoughts, obviously. I'm going to say this one thing real quick, though. I have no reason to believe in this team or in this organization at this point. We are talking not just 10 years of mediocrity under Jason Garrett and the handful of times we were good, we weren't able to put anything together because our coaching has held us back. In this case, it's not all coaching. The players certainly have their share in this debacle. But uh, I just don't have any faith in this organization because why would I? We're talking like 25 years since they were relevant. You want to talk relevant? Relevant is being in the conference championship game. It's been 25 years. You were in some really bad company in waiting for that appearance. So, yeah, what, what I'm going to say in this case, I'm not going to fall for this again. I'm not going to buy into this. I will continue covering the Cowboys. I will continue analyzing and breaking it down and doing this show. But I'm not going to get sucked into the hype machine again. I'm not going to go into this with a rosy, rosy goggled view as a fan. I'm just looking at this purely as a sports journalist, unbiased, impartial, just pure analysis. Except for this one last video. Because I am planning to go thermonuclear one last time. Just to, just to get it off of my chest, out of my mind, I am going to go off. So if you give me just one moment, let me, just give me a moment, one moment. Are you freaking kidding me? Dallas goes to the goes with the season on the line. All we've heard week after week throughout this disastrous season is, "Oh, hey man, we're still in control of our destiny. It's all right. We still control our destiny. We still control our destiny. We still control our destiny." You don't control your damn destiny anymore. Why? Because with your season on the line, with a chance to close out the division, playoff implications, you squander it with piss poor play. The Cowboys had six or seven drops yesterday in the game. Amari Cooper, I know you've battled all year through injuries. I know you have. And I don't want to rake you over the coals for that because I understand there were weeks in which you could barely walk throughout the week, let alone practice, and then you still played. But the fact is, you weren't good when you played. And your play on the road this year continued to be garbage that is the one huge complaint with Amari Cooper in Dallas if he has played on the road he has been a decoy at best an afterthought largely I mean Jesus man we're talking about a guy who when he plays at home he plays for the most part like the best receiver in the league if you look at just the stats and production certainly a pro bowler a first team all NFL player that's what you're kind of looking at in that production. But he goes on the road. The guy looks like a wide receiver number three. And I understand, again, he's been playing through injury, so I don't want to be too unfair to him. And I'll get back to why even as bad as he played in this game, they still squandered everything in this. So before we get into that, holy shit, you've got to be kidding me with that kind of production, man. The Cowboys... Everything on the line. The Philadelphia Eagles, I get it. They're 7-7 seven and seven going into that game as well. Both of these teams suck. It's the worst division in football this year. But no matter what, you still had a chance to not only get in the playoffs, but host a home game. The Eagles were the walking wounded coming into this game. They didn't have any of their wide receivers. They barely had Ertz for part of this game. They had injuries at the line. They had everywhere. Injuries, devastating injuries. And they had played as bad as... As Dallas had played, now Philadelphia is the one who's like, hey man, we're a little hot. We just ran one, two, three through the division right here to close this out. Now they got to go back to New York next week and they still technically have to win against the Giants uh, with Daniel Jones back and it's in New York. They have to win that game to clinch the division. If they lose and Dallas beats the Redskins, then technically Dallas, not even technically, Dallas still wins the division. 
Uh, but good God, man, we don't freaking deserve any of it. We don't deserve it, and I've been saying that for a while now. This team is trash. This is, I will take, I will own part of this. I was one of those people who woefully overestimated this team. I looked at this roster and I said, this is the most talented Cowboys team I've seen since 2007. I looked at what they did last year after the Amari Cooper trade, and I said, they've added weapons to that. They've added Randall Cobb. They've added uh, Robert Quinn. They ended up adding Michael Bennett, who I still think was a pretty good player for them in his short tenure with them. Like, they added weapons everywhere. And they had another crop of drafted players, which, by the way, None of them really contributed very much this year other than Tony Pollard, who only was allowed to contribute a little bit because of personnel decisions and coaching, which that's on Garrett, that's on Kellen Moore, that's on all of them as far as I'm concerned. It's garbage what we did this year. This is a this is a horrifically bad performance as a coach, but also as players. You don't lead the NFL in drops and missed field goals and missed tackles without it being somewhat on the players. It's not all purely coaching, but you can say this, hey, how long do we keep Brett Maher on the team this year, even though we knew he was hurting us? We kept him until two weeks ago. Until two weeks ago, we kept him on there, leading the NFL in missed field goals, and knowing he hurt us. That's garbage. That's on Garrett. That is the coaching in that regard, in that regard. Just personnel decision for your roster. Uh, I saw in this game, in the second half, Cheeto got benched. Healthy bench. No injuries, no nothing. The Eagles kept going after him and after him and after him. And he couldn't do anything. He couldn't do anything when he was guarding guys by the name of... Argus... Wait. Arcega Whiteside? You let Arcega Whiteside touch you up for 39 yards, Cheeto? Two catches? Come on, man. The Eagles attacked you relentlessly. The Cowboys, the fact that they didn't bench him earlier in the year, if nothing else, just as a disciplinary measure, just to say, look, if you're not focused, if you're not ready, sit your ass down, learn from your lesson, and come back with a chip on your shoulder. The fact they didn't do that is crap. This It makes no sense, the decisions this coaching staff made and the way that these players played. The players were terrible yesterday. To his credit, Kai Forbath was the best player out there. But even in that situation, you have Dallas settling for these field goals and just not, not executing. Forbath hits twice from 49, again from 32. He's the one guy that scored. He's the only light in this shit sandwich. Why is there a light in a shit sandwich? I just, I, whatever. This is an utter disaster. This is a debacle for the Dallas Cowboys. And Jerry Jones, after the game, he's he's shocked. He doesn't have a whole lot to say. He's trying to offer up the, well, you know, I guess we could still go to Washington and handle business. But, dude, at best, at best, you will be 8-8. Eight and eight. And it's only fitting that the 8-8 eight and eight door be the one to hit Jason Garrett on his ass on the way out the door. This is... This is a disaster. I understand injuries play a role in it. Players play a role in it. And coaching. It's There's so many facets in this situation that contributed to this result. But this is a team who we thought would be bare minimum 10 and 6. There were people saying 12 and 4. There were people whose, res- whose opinions I really respect. Sports journalists whose, I, whose opinions I really respect. Who had this team at 12 and 4? And I don't think that we were blind. I think this team just, as Dak Prescott said earlier in the year, they were sniffing themselves a little bit. They were looking at themselves and they were feeling like, yeah, man, we got this. And it makes no sense because they went through this gauntlet last year. They were 3-5 and five and they had to rally just to get into the playoffs. But they won 10 games last year. They still won 10 games despite losing five in the first half of the season so they were a younger team who went through worse adversity and overcame it in several key road games at philadelphia at atlanta it was a home game then but against new orleans like they went through so much and this year it just looks like they don't know how to win how else do you explain that the slow starts have continued to plague this team that is their greatest identity this season 
the slow starts offensively and defensively. Dallas starts this game in another 10-0 hole. If Philadelphia doesn't miss a couple field goals, closing out the first half and then the start of the second half, we're looking at another 23-6 hole at one point in this game. This team is garbage. Garbage. It doesn't make any sense because Dallas in this situation... They had so many opportunities on third and short, and they couldn't get make anything happen with it. Now, Philadelphia misses a 53-yarder before the half. Dallas goes down and actually gets a field goal to cut the lead a little bit. And so at that point, you're like, dude, it's 10-6 at half. Dallas starts the second half with the ball, goes on a great drive, gets down to the Philadelphia about 22-yard line. Third and one, they're going to go with a pitch to Tony Pollard, and Pollard fumbles, fumbles the ball. So now not only are you not cutting it to a one-point game potentially, but now you're completely SOL because now the Eagles are going to go driving the other way and they're going to cap it off with a freaking touchdown. So now you're down 17 to 6 instead of 10 to 9. That's it, literally. That's your game. Dallas made so many baffling decisions in this game. I understand Dak was bad. Dak said after the game that the the AC joint wasn't a problem for him. Dude, I I don't believe that. I think Dak is just a guy who's going to always say I'm not making excuses. I'm going to fall on the sword. I'm going to take the brunt of this because I don't want to be the guy who stands up here and makes excuses or tries to deflect blame elsewhere. No, that's what his head coach Jason Garrett does because that's all Jason Garrett has done over the past couple months at least. Anytime anything has been directed at him of like, hey, what was this play call? Or hey, what was this game management decision? He deflects everywhere hey why didn't you go here why'd you go here well you know we called this play which has a couple different options on it so really it's on Dak for picking that particular option like that's the kind of crap Garrett's been saying not to get off on the wilderness here on the Mavericks the Mavericks had uh an enormous historically bad collapse in the fourth quarter yesterday as well against the Toronto Raptors and you know what happened after the game Rick Carlisle immediately came out and took all of the blame for it He said, now I understand, NFL's different. You got coordinators and the head coach, but the head coach still has the option to override or veto anything a coordinator says. But on one hand, you have a coach with actual integrity taking all of the blame and saying, you know what, this is on me, I have to have them better. Even if it's a player's misjudgment, he has to say, he'll say, I have to coach up that player to make a better decision there. That's on me. Make it that what you will. New subscriber, hello. Then you pivot over and take a look instead at what Jason Garrett does, and it's deflecting. It's, oh, it's Dak. Oh, it's Kellen Moore. Oh, it's uh, Rod Marinelli. Oh, it's Chris Richard. He never assumes any blame at all. It's always deflect and obfuscate from anything looking at him because he doesn't want to finger point it in his direction. It's 10 years of trusting your process, and what have we gotten out of it? You started with three straight eight and eight years. You did eventually fix your record a little bit because you had a couple seasons where your team overperformed. The last three years have really helped you stretch that away and escape the shadow of eight and eight. But my God, dude, you're basically a 500 coach in a lot of respects. Like you'll have now at best, if this is another eight and eight year, you'll have your fourth eight and eight season. You got one losing season, I know. You can balance that out with a 2014 that was strong. But this team just doesn't go far with you. And for all your talk about the process, you never open up the hood and say, hey, is the process working? Do I need to change? Do I need to adapt my philosophy? Because after 10 years, we still haven't gotten past the divisional round. That's a little weird if you think about it. No, he can't because he won't. He refuses to to analyze himself. This team has never been able to make in-game adjustments. When they have a game plan and they go in, especially on the road, and things aren't working like they want or need them to, Dallas just shuts down. They have no idea what the hell they're doing. When their first 15 plays are scripted week after week and then the team starts slow, you think, huh, how much of that is the scripted plays not being ideal? Like, once you get... Beyond those, beyond those first two or three possessions, because a lot of times we're talking about short drives that go nowhere. Once you get past that, we seem to play better. Or when we put ourselves in a little bit of an up-tempo offense, Dak seems to play better. Weird. Weird how that works. Well, we better slow things down because this is getting, we want to minimize potential for mistake. Are you freaking kidding me? It makes 
no sense what this man does at all. Now, the Cowboys, I'm not making excuses for them. And again, I'm not putting it all on Garrett. I put a lot on Garrett, but the players were garbage this year. They all, as Dak said, sniffed themselves too much. And most all of them underperformed. Now, Michael Gallup is one of the few guys I felt like in training camp, we looked at and said, dude, he looks like he's prime for a big second year. And you know what? With yesterday's game, five catches, 98 yards. Michael Gallup has gone over a thousand yards on the season. He is one of the few players that I look at and say, and even he had mistakes yesterday, but he's one of the few players I look at and I say, he met expectations this year. He took that next step and performed even better than he had. And then what we expected him to play as in this season, Dak, you started damn hot, man, damn hot. But the last four or five weeks, you've largely been an afterthought. Now you were good in this Rams game. I know you got hurt in that. That's the AC joint. I know a lot of, a lot of this week you could barely throw the ball and you don't want to make excuses. So you're going to tell everyone that, Oh no, no, the shoulder is not what was responsible for me missing some of these throws. You missed Tavon Austin on what would have been uh, a touchdown and set you up for a two point conversion to tie the game with like three minutes and change left. You, you missed a lot of throws yesterday. I get it. I understand and I'm still believing that there's something with the shoulder. I'm not going to give you a total pass, but I'm going to give you a partial pass on that. Your team didn't do enough to help you. Ezekiel Elliott, our new $90 million running back, you talked before this game saying, hey man, whatever it takes, I historically I have always owned Philadelphia. Philadelphia has never beaten Dallas in a game in which I played. That's everything we heard from Zeke. He eats when he plays Philly. He's always talking about feed me. Well, he eats well when he plays Philly in his career. And he said before, you know, if Dak can't throw it, fine, run me 30 times, 40 times, 50 times. I don't care. 13 carries, 47 yards. 3.6 in average. Yeah. Um, I understand the flow of the game. Dallas, you know, once they're behind 17-6, it kind of shifts things. They can't really rely on the run as much, but... You know what? In that second half, Zeke didn't do much of anything. Like, whether you're talking about the he gets an eight-yard run after the half on, like, the first drive, and he's immediately, you know, basically calling in a sub. And now here we are on this key play. And, oh, look, an absolute disaster. Whether we want to talk about that, whether we want to talk about um, just in general him not stepping up. This was a bad year from Zeke. I don't care... What you're saying, like, you might say, well, hey, Zeke's bad year is still a great year for a lot of running backs. Uh, okay, cool. But it's still a bad year by his standards, and you compare to yourself. You don't go, hey, man, Todd Gurley would have loved to have had that year this year. Well, good for Todd Gurley. He's had a disastrous year for the Rams. He had he bounced back a little bit in the last stretch of it. But on the whole, this was a bad year for Zeke. Like, had he not been suspended those six games in his second season, I think he would have put out better numbers than we saw this year. Career low for him over the course of a 16-game season in terms of carries, in terms of yards. This is a bad year from Zeke. Now, you saw last game, and you saw flashes of it here and there. But Zeke is not built like the same running back he was when he came into the league. He's not built like he's a... Like, he's really a running back. He's almost built more like a fullback at this point. Zeke, there, there's a reason Zeke doesn't pop huge runs anymore. For as much as we've invested in our offensive line and for what you would expect an elite running back to be able to do, there is a correlation there. Coming into the year, Zeke said his, said his weight was down to the lowest it had been since his rookie year. That's, that's great, but it took you a while to get going. And then we saw three, maybe four runs on the season of like 20 plus yard runs. And those didn't come until the last month of the season. So all your talk about you putting this thing on your back and you going, if, you're our, if you and the offensive line are our identity, we got fucking amnesia or something here, dude, because we don't know what the hell that we are anymore. When we do lean on you, things work a little bit better for a little while. Garrett said, you know, after the Rams game, like, oh, we remembered our DNA, which is his way of saying... We stopped throwing the ball so much and we went back to my 90s offense and that's why we were successful, damn it. Okay, we tried to do it again this week and it went for nothing. Absolutely nothing. Zeke was a non-factor in this game. Dak was a non-factor in this game. 
Cooper, four for 24. I talked about him earlier. He was not good, man. Dallas at times, they looked like they were scared to me. Jason Garrett in particular. The the kind of decisions he was making when he was settling for 49-yard field goals or whatever. The 32-yarder was obviously due to time. He had to take that. But the two 49-yard field goals, it's like, dude, we're talking like a fourth and one here. And you've got to have this. Like, you've got to do something here. And to his credit, I guess you could say the, t- the Cowboys did fail on third and short a lot in this game. But fourth and nine, they went for it, and they found Randall Cobb. Randall Cobb was having a good game for him. I actually want to say I don't have it on the board here. I want to take a look at what his, to- his total stats were. Five for 73 for Randall Cobb. So Cobb and Cooper are two of your three best weapons at receiver. Gallup is your number two. And yet, and this goes back to coaching, what happened? You had a fourth and eight with your season on the line. And what did you do? No Cobb, no Cooper. Jason Garrett asked after the game, Oh, is he going to take any blame in this case? Is he going to say, yes, this was a mistake, or yes, we should have done something? Hey, man, you had timeouts. If they needed a blow, if they needed a rest, call a freaking timeout. Otherwise, how do you not have them out there? We're told neither of them were benched. Cobb had just made a couple great plays on that drive to get you down into that situation, into Philadelphia territory. Cobb had gotten you there. He was making things happen. As much as you want to say that Michael Jenkins was giving fits to Amari Cooper, Cobb was chewing him up a little bit on that drive. So how do you not go to Randall Cobb? How do you not have him in the game? Jason Garrett calls himself, he's part of the coaching tree of Nick Saban. He was there with him briefly in Miami when Saban was there for a cup of coffee before he ran back to the college ranks and to his credit became probably the greatest college coach of all time. This isn't about him, but Nick Saban said years ago, in the early 2000s, he learned it's not about plays, it's about players. Do you understand that? So Jason Garrett, for his super vanilla cookie cutter offense built out of the 90s, he's been trying to run for all these years. What made it work? What Was it that the plays are foolproof? No, it's the players. It's the talent. If you have the talent... You can be a little bit more vanilla in your approach because it's like, hey, our Jacks have to be better than their Joes. When they are, great. You can get away with running those archaic offenses a little bit. Now, I still think they're going to ultimately bite you in the ass trying to do that, but that's something you can do. Jason Garrett, in this case, ignored that completely. He said, hey, there were five options on that play and, you know, uh... That, that's an assessment to be made there, and we didn't want to alter that. Didn't want to alter it. If you have Cooper and Cobb out there, it's not like you lose options. You still got five options. I would argue, because of the caliber of player that the two of them are, your options are better than if they're out, if they're out there than if they're not out there. Obviously. How do you not, in that situation, with your season on the line, do that? Even, even if Cooper has had a rough stretch because of his injuries... Even with that being the case, what have we seen all year long? If he's out there, at the very least, the other team has to account for him. At the very least. So if they have to account for him, hey, guess what? Two guys collapsed onto Michael Gallup as he tried to make that catch in the end zone on fourth and eight. If you got Cooper opposite him, that attention might shade that way a little bit more. Now you get a one-on-one look, you got a better chance. This, that, that, that's a fireable offense. Your last snap of the game for the Cowboys. You make that decision. You had three timeouts. It's classic Jason Garrett being over conservative. The mentality, the mission, the goal is always to score. Step one, score a touchdown. Step two, If step one fails, okay, fine. Have those timeouts so that you can try and get the ball back. But mission one is score a touchdown. So if, if, if you needed 
arrest for either of those guys, fourth and eight, yo, use it. Use it. Because what you did instead is you completely sent plan A to the slaughter. You were, they were, it was a lamb to the slaughter that you did. And you're like, oh, all right, well, you know what? We're just going to roll this play without uh, two of our three best receivers. And, you know, the, the whole season boils down to this one play. Let's just sit them out. They need a moment uh, or whatever. And, hey, we got three timeouts. We'll try and get the ball back. Are you dense? Are you that dense? I know you went to Princeton, but are you that dense that that is your decision? That is a fireable offense. And it's just one to a list of 47,362 over your 10-year coaching career here. It's ridiculous that we settled for that. Now, I'm trying to see here some of these other notes. This is Amari Cooper after the game talking to John Mashoda. Amari Cooper, I know I didn't play my best game at all. It was terrible. When you play important games like this, everybody has to bring their A game if we really want to win. And I don't think we did tonight. Now, Cooper talking about the fourth and eight play, respective, like, directly after the game pretty much said yeah no i wasn't I, I i wanted to be out there i needed to be out there like he basically took a veiled shot at the coaches in that regard like for some reason they just didn't put me out there <sighs> players not plays oh my god man joey eichel's on twitter ike is on twitter excuse me uh, is Amari hurt? Probably. Has he been hurt a lot? Yes. Now, this is him talking about the Amari Cooper contract situation. He says, has he proven to be a player who can consistently, in all caps, perform despite being banged up? Absolutely not. Do you want to lock yourself into a player who's been hurt a lot and who can't consistently perform when hurt? Now, depends on what the number is, because... If we're going to talk about that, okay. We talked about Des Bryant being a guy who couldn't pl perform when hurt towards the end. Like, we, we talk about guys being warriors when they play when they're hurt, but when they don't play, then they don't get trashed. Look at Adam Thielen. He was banged up this year, and he sat out games. Cooper, meanwhile, tried to fight through it, didn't miss a game this year. And what what's his reward? What is his reward? He's getting trashed, and he's got people saying he doesn't deserve the contract now. It hurt his production, no doubt. And I understand uh, what Joey is saying here. And I agree. There's a conversation to be had. But un unless we're talking north of $17 million a year, I think you got to do it. I think you're dumb not to do it. Because he's going to be a pro bowler again this year, probably. And that's going to make, what, five and six years for him? Four and five years, maybe? Four and five years for him. I mean, that that's unreal what he's able to do. Also, like this call-out from Bob Sturm on Twitter. Nothing demonstrates how bad the last 25 years of Cowboys football has been. Quite like legions of young fans who consider the Tony Romo, Des Bryant era to be some sort of glory days. 2010 to 2015 was the exact same meal as this, but served on a different plate, fellas. That is, that is dead on the money perfection in that tweet. Because that, that really sums everything up great. Like... As much as we talk about how, hey man, 14 was a phenomenal year. We should have gone all the way. We could have at least gotten to the NFC Championship game or Super Bowl. Uh, we were good enough to do that. We just didn't do it. Play calling decisions hurt us. Players didn't help. I understand there were some key mistakes in that, but whatever. 2016, coaching decisions hurt us. Killing momentum, calling a timeout that only stunted your own offense's momentum and then saved time for Aaron Rodgers to do Aaron Rodgers things. 2018, hottest team in the NFL going into the playoffs. You you knocked around the the Seahawks pretty well, and then you went in with all the momentum in the world, and because you game plan so piss poorly, you got railroaded. And now you still had up until literally up until literally yesterday before kickoff, you still had people saying, "Hey man, they just beat the Rams, and the Rams just beat the Seahawks pretty handily. Seahawks aren't that bad. That might be a team you end up facing, that you might end up hosting in the playoffs if you get in, if you win your division. And so then you would have beaten the Rams. You would have beaten the Eagles. Then you'd basically have a bye week because the week 17 wouldn't matter against the Redskins. You'd have a bye week, and then you might be facing a Seahawks team that just proved that they could get beaten by a team 
beaten handily by a team that you just beat handily. I'm just saying, bro. I'm just saying. Once you do that, go through them. Oh, look at that. Look at that. You're you're on your way. Hey, you could do it. You could get into the NFC Championship game, which, you know, that we haven't been there in 25 years. Downside of that, I guess, would be if you, you extend Jason Garrett's era here further. No fucking chance. No fucking chance. The delusional perspective has been maddening for me to observe because at the very start of the year when we started 3-0, I tried telling people, yo, look at this defense. Look at the big plays they're giving up. Look at the mistakes they're making. Look at the cracks in the armor of this team. Nah, nah, man. Uh, we're not trying to hear that. You're just a hater. You're just being negative. You're overanalyzing. Am I? We then lose three straight games. Three and three. Well, yeah, okay, yeah, but we figure things out. You know, it's early in the year. We're, we're figuring out the growing pains. We'll, we'll reestablish. Okay. We were five and three. We were five and three through eight games this year. To close out the season, we lost, what, eight of our final 11? We had lost seven out of 10 when we lost to the Bears. Then we beat the Rams. So, yeah, that was uh, lost seven out of 11 at that point. And then you lose again this week. 8 out of 12 games. 8 out of 12 games. And you still had people with a straight fucking face talking online, talking on radio shows. Radio shows in Dallas. Saying this team could capture the magic of the 9-7 and seven New York Giants that won it all in 2012, I think it was. The exception does not prove the rule. And if you just thought that this coaching staff and that these players who had underperformed all year, if you just thought they were going to turn it on, I can do a better snap than that. Turn it on. You're lying to yourself. You're being delusional. If you think this team was going to do that, this team was exactly what Vegas said it was. I acknowledged earlier, I missed it. I thought this was a much better team. I thought this was a team that was a legitimate Super Bowl contender. Jalen Smith had a crap year, and yet he was trying to t trying to uh, campaign to get fans to vote him into the Pro Bowl and then complained about the Pro Bowl, Bowl voting system when he didn't get in. Are you serious? You had a bad year, dude. You were... You were snubbed last year, I think. I honestly feel you were snubbed last year. But you were 10 times better last year than you were this year. You have guys who have gotten paid and look like the happy, fat cats at this point. You have other guys who just thought that we were a better team and didn't have the real... I think they have leaders on this team. But there's a reason why Michael Bennett, who came from a winning culture, came in and was like, what the hell is this? There's a reason he was the one who blew up in the locker room after that loss a couple weeks ago. That he was the one who went off in the locker room on the rest of his team. It wasn't Jason Witten. It wasn't, you know, old hat, old guard Jason Witten. It wasn't Zach Martin. It wasn't Dak. It wasn't Zeke. It wasn't Demarcus Lawrence. Who was it? The guy who came from a winning culture. The guy who was a Super Bowl champion with one of the greatest defenses built in the in this like this century. One of the greatest defenses built. He was a big part of that. Then he went to New England where he played in the epitome of a winning culture. The Cowboys have not been a winning culture. Not for 25 years. I don't give a shit what our overall record is under Jason Garrett. You can't get past the divisional round. You can't get into the conference championship game. That puts you into territory, into the same company as the Bills, the Browns. You know what? I think that's it. I think that's it. Because the Jags got there. The Cardinals got there. Cardinals got to a Super Bowl. 
That's your territory. That is your company you keep. Drink that in. Absorb that message. This team and its culture, it's broken. How do you change that culture? Jerry's not going to fire himself as GM. You're not going to bring in Troy Aikman or whatever, regardless of what Troy wants to do. What you're going to do is you're going to look instead for the next way you can change. How, how do you do that? It's the coaching staff. It's the coaching staff. That's the only thing you can change. It has to be Jason Garrett gone. I honestly, I don't, I don't see anything worth keeping Kellen Moore for. I mean, maybe, maybe you do, but if you bring in a new head coach, Jerry would be the only coach stupid, or excuse me, the only, he wants to be coach, the only owner stupid enough to do this to basically say, hey, we'll change head coach, fine, but Kellen Moore, you're going to stay. Uh, Marinelli, you, you might stay. Uh, and in the meantime, we're going to just tell whoever the new head coach coming in is, hey, this, this is what you, you got. You got to come in knowing that you can't change your staff. Who's going to do that? You think Lincoln Riley's leaving Oklahoma for that? Do you? He's not. Spoiler. He's not. Do you think that... Do you think that uh, any of those top candidates are going to do that? Urban Meyer? You got a lot of former Buckeyes. We've talked about the character issues that typically follow uh, Urban Meyer programs. We know he's got, you know, ties to the Jerry Jones, Jerry Jones family and all that. So who knows? Maybe, maybe that's where they go. And maybe we'll have some new wild ass circus shit to talk about with this team because they are a running circus. They are the greatest circus in sports because they don't even have to be good or worth a damn to still get national headlines week after week, day after day, year after year. I did that in complete out of order, but the point still stands. This team, this team might have finally broken me in that regard. I, I know it's not the first time I've said something like this, but this is the first time it feels definitive for me. I will cover this team. I will talk about this team. I will still give you all of the analysis that I can. I will still write about this team and do all of that. But the days of me wearing the, the fan goggles and all of that in this case, I think they're done. I think once you start looking at it that closely and you start paying attention to all of that on that deep of a level and having to talk about them and write about them on that no matter what happens, I think to some degree when you get slapped in the face 9,700 times, it sinks in that maybe I should stop leaning in when they do something good. They do something good, I lean in, they slap me across the face. I recoil, things go quiet for a minute, they start winning again, I lean in, I get slapped in the face again. Like, that's what this feels like. I'm gonna step back, I'm gonna let this team finish crashing and burning, Maybe they go 8-8, eight and eight, in which case, like I said earlier, it's only fitting that the 8-8 eight and eight door is the one that hits Garrett on the ass on the way out. Maybe they have a losing season. Maybe they go 7-9, and nine, and that becomes Dak's first losing season of his career and uh, you know completely undercuts them in that regard. I don't know. I don't care. It means nothing. If the Eagles beat the Giants next week in New York, it's over. If the Eagles lose and the Cowboys win... Cowboys still get it, but they don't fucking deserve it. They don't deserve it a little bit. Not one damn little bit. <sighs> How did I feel at the end of the game the other night? That is Cowboys football thank god for the dallas mavericks even though they disappointed the hell out of me yesterday you know what the future's damn bright and i'm gonna enjoy some basketball that's it for my time guys sorry for venting on this long session uh, if you like this video don't forget to leave it a thumbs up leave a comment below subscribe to the dallas prospect and until next time remember every legend was once a prospect peace